Good morning, everybody. I'm Marcel Maya. I'm a neuroradiologist at Cedars, and uh, I'm fortunate to work with uh, Vader, and we've been going at this for a while. Um, but here I am uh, to welcome our first speaker, who um, is a professor of neurology at UCSF, Dr. Morris Levin, and he's um, particularly interested in the diagnostic side of headache medicine in differential diagnosis, and he's also a member of International Headache Society, and uh, he's going to talk to us about the differential diagnosis of orthostatic headaches. Please. Good morning. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for that intro. Not only am I a member of the um, International Headache Society, I'm a member of the classification committee at the IHS. And I'm saying that because uh, it's sort of a disclosure that uh, you need to know. I'm uh, obsessed, I guess, in a way, with classification. So that's probably why I was asked to do this talk. Um, thanks so much, um, Buder and Dr. Delane, for inviting me to this conference. Uh, uh, I think this is an un, uh, unprecedented um, uh, get-together that I think uh, we need to see more and more of. Um, I just had the chance to talk to a leaker, um, which is what patients are calling themselves. These stories are amazing, as you know, um, and uh, I think this field deserves a lot of attention. So uh, what I did today, let's see if I can figure this out. So this is... See, I'm supposed to. The green button. Got it. Oh, here are my disclosures. I, I probably should linger on this a little bit. I, I don't think I have any potential conflict, but you can judge for yourself. I put down at the bottom royalties from uh, publishers because I've learned about myself. I hate to say something that contradicts something I've written before. This is quite a bias, actually. All right, this is what I thought I'd do. I didn't quite know um, what would be best for you all to, to, to hear and think about in terms of diagnosis. It is what I'm fascinated by in, in medicine, in neurology, and in, in headache medicine. Um, but what I, what I thought I'd do is uh, just go over quickly some terms and talk about uh, what happens to the head when, when we move. You'll hear a lot more about that from Dr. Silberstein in a few minutes. Um, and then... Um, I would, um, I'll go through what I think are the most important uh, possibilities that might be happening in patients with orthostatic headaches and see what you think. And I'll draw a few conclusions again. I'd love to hear feedback. I, I'm, I'm told that questions aren't going to happen till the end, but uh, you know, um, I don't know if you've ever been to a Quaker meeting, but uh, if the spirit moves you, uh, I don't see why you shouldn't just start, you know, call out or, uh, you know, hurl whatever at me. All right, what's orthostasis? Okay, orthostasis, excuse me. Maintenance of an upright standing position, right? Orthostasis. Uh, things can go wrong with this orthostasis, like orthostatic hypotension, um, also known as postural hypotension, a drop by at least 20 millimeters of mercury um, or, uh, in systolic or diastolic 10 millimeters when a person stands up. Why does orthostatic hypotension happen? You know, uh, we, we learned this in med school. Why does it happen? So either there is significant hypovolemia, a person's just hypovolemic, or there are more likely defective autonomic reflexes that are aimed at controlling the whole idea of venous pooling. Uh, and then there's less cardiac return and so on. And it has a little bit of relevance to uh, orthostatic headaches. What's an orthostatic headache, also known as postural headache? Headache that occurs or is made much worse by standing and remaining standing. Um, in, interestingly, in post-LP headaches, the headache uh, happens very quickly, within about 20 seconds. Generally resolves after um, sitting or lying. Um, in other intracranial hypotension conditions, not so, uh, not so quick sometimes or, or even clear. Why might orthostatic headaches occur? And so one, op one possibility is um, there is low intracranial CSF volume or pressure already, and then now there's a, a sudden decrease because of the change in position, reduced brain buoyancy, brain is buoyant, being held up by some fluid, and skull contents, namely the brain and linings, uh, shift downward, stretching the dura. 
For some reason, our duras are richly endowed with nociceptive fibers, and any uh, traction can translate into pain, as long as it um, uh, reaches threshold level for pain. Or, and here you'll hear probably, I think, all day long you'll be hearing about the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, um, which states that intracranial volume needs to be constant. Sudden dilation of cerebral vessels may be happening in an attempt to maintain this, this doctrine. What if there is a large enough intracranial lesion that a sudden shift in position or a, a new orientation to gravity changes um, the dynamics of intracranial contents, and we have a shifting of those contents. What if there's a mass large enough, or uh, such as tumor, hematoma, or what if the mass is adherent to some richly endowed nociceptive structures? It, it's conceivable, I think. Have to be a fairly large mass, or have to be fairly adherent. And here's something that's fascinated me for years. Um, of course, patients are always thinking they have lesions in their sinuses and, and elsewhere. But the fact is, sinus, orbital, pericranial, cervical lesions can respond to changes in position, can respond to gravity, stimulate nociceptors uh, on movement, and then, develop, and then produce pain, become a pain generator. Would that be perceived in the head? Absolutely. Could be, because of this very, and you probably all know this, but this very um, almost confounding um, problem we have with head nociception. As you know, the, uh, all nociception and all sensation really uh, from the anterior part of the head and anterior um, portions intracranially above the tentorium are transmitted via the trigeminal nerve. Infratentorial and posterior head structures transmit pain uh, via upper cervical roots. That sounds good. That sounds like a good system. Um, pain, you know, as you've thought about it for years, has to have a sort of a localizing nature to it, right? Pain is, in fact, defined as a, this unpleasant um, situation f coming from a certain spot. Well, in the head, that's not very reliable. These different pain generators can produce pain perceived in um, sometimes distant areas. It has to do with the fact that the upper cervical roots and trigeminal afferents um, converge in the region of the spinal trigeminal nucleus, dorsal horn of the spinal cord, and C2, C3 or so. Hence, um, generators, for example, in the sinus, in the spine, upper spine, in the eyes, in any of the head and neck cranial regions can produce headache, even though you'd think that the localization would be somewhere um, more closely um, akin to the generator. So of these possibilities, um, I thought I'd break down the, the clinical conundrum into um, conditions that produce postural headaches due to decreased CSF pressure or volume and everything else. So I'll see if, you, see if this makes sense to you. I think it's a, a sensible clinical, at least, approach. So intracranial hypotension, so that, as a cause for postural headaches, what's the, what are the, the likely um, um, mechanisms, the likely causes? And of course, Dr. Shevink has um, very beautifully, um, with, with a, a great deal of data, subdivided these, and again, you'll hear more about this later today, but uh, I think that the quintessential um, condition is traumatic CSF leak, whether it's direct trauma. A car accident, whatever, diagnostic LP, accidental dural puncture during spinal anesthesia, spinal cranial surgery, spinal uh, CSF leak from trauma. This used to get talked about a lot. I think it's, it's um, uh, much less common. Dural tear from something in the spine, some, some um, difficult issue in the spine, disc herniation, spondylosis, something like that, dural tear. Weakness of the dural sac is becoming clear that um, this is much more common when we thought, than we thought. Things like meningeal diverticuli, um, abnormalities of connective tissue, and so on, uh, with either a second spacing or a tear, a tear of these, these more delicate structures. CSF venous fistulas, they occur, they're not that common. And CSF shunt over drainage. I, I assume that severe hypovolemia on its own can do it. I think it's very rare. So those are the options for 
um, producing intracranial hypotension and then postural headaches. I mentioned my interest in headache classification. This is what um, headache specialists use. It's called the International Classification of Headache Disorders. Came out with a third revision, but in a beta version, um, three years ago. And this was done on purpose to allow years of um, input from experts about these criteria for, um, for all of the entities that can cause headache. And a lot of criteria did come in, and it was, very, it was a very useful time. Um, I'm on this committee, and we met uh, several times in the last three years. Most recently, we've been doing this over email, and we've produced a final version. It's going to be published um, in cephalalgia in the early part of next year. And here is basically how that classification breaks down uh, intracranial hypotension. Um, Post-dural puncture, CSF fistula, in other words, a leak, um, or everything else, spontaneous intracranial hypertension. I'm not sure this is the best way to do it, but that's the way they do it. I want to just show it to you briefly because you'll probably be exposed to it. Um, so this is the general category, headache attributed to low cerebrospinal fluid pressure, and notice uh, that number. Does everybody like that number? No. No, not really. I know. Um, here's a comment after the definition. Headache that's significantly worse than soon after sitting, et cetera. Um, but I like this last sentence. I actually think it's a very important one, but this cannot, or the last part of the sentence, this cannot be relied upon as a diagnostic criterion. It's, it's really, it's, it's tricky. And I'll try and share my philosophy with you later about these clues to diagnosis. Anyway, here's the first of the three entities in the classification. This is the uh, post-LP headache. I won't go through it in detail. Here's the CSF fistula headache. Again, there's that, that number, and this is the everything else, spontaneous intracranial hypotension. The, the leak has not been um, uh, um, explained, and there's that number again. So um, people are addicted to these numbers. The same thing's true for um, uh, intracranial hypertension, right? These numbers. Um, I remember being in debates about whether it needed to be 250. 230, 220, what if, there was a, what if the patient was obese? Uh, what about certain body types? It's really difficult. One of my favorite New Yorker cartoons, look, the numbers don't lie. Or do they? So here's a case. Um, LP was performed on a 32-year-old obese woman presenting with frequent headaches accompanied by nausea and vomiting, particularly frequent around menses. Fundus exam had revealed papilledema. This sounds like a perfect case of pseudotumor increased intracranial pressure, except that it wasn't really papilledema, it was drusen. But of course, uh, this patient got an LP, and following the LP, she had a holocranial headache worsened with sitting or standing, accompanied by nausea. And after an epidural blood patch, her headaches got better. This is post-LP headache, of course. And the drusen are called pseudopapilledema. Um, I've trained residents for years, and uh, one of the hardest things to teach residents is fun, uh, fundoscopic exam, right? Because we all go through medical school um, faking it. Am, am, I, am I wrong? Um, and so how do we get better at it? Look at a lot of fundi and uh, pictures, and uh, it's, you know, the, the more I do this, the more I, uh, drusen I see. Uh, is, it, is it that there's an epidemic of, of drusen? No, it's because I'm getting better. So here's another case. After microsurgery for removing an L1 um, herniated disc, it's uh, L1, L2 disc near the L1 root, 56-year-old man complained of perirectal pain, incontinence, and a new headache, worse with sitting and standing and relieved by sitting and lying down. There's this, uh, an axial view of the CT Milo, revealed a dural leak right at the level of surgery. It was repaired with a couple of stitches and a headache resolved, but the patient was left with perirectal pain, incontinence, um, and um, uh, just discomfort with any movement in his lower back and, and uh, groin. And, you know, so this person had two issues after surgery. One was that um, as this area was approached uh, surgically, um, guess where you are when you're trying to fix um, uh, an L1, L2 disc from posterior direction. 
you're in conus land, as my neurosurgery friends say. And that's not a good place to be if you're not very, very careful, and the conus was, was traumatized. So, you know, one of the things that happens in these cases, and every time I talk to um, a patient with uh, um, successful or unsuccessfully treated um, uh, SIH, it's, it's as if it's a different entity, a different story, and everybody's got a different story. So this story was, um, this is a, a patient I, I was um, involved pretty closely with. There was so much pain, it was very hard to sort things out. It's easy when I present it like this to sort it out, but it was very hard in, in, the, in the reality to sort this out. He was miserable, you know, absolutely miserable with all of his pain conditions, and there were really two uh, generators. Oh, this is the conus again. Let's see if I've got a pointer that actually, does this help me? I guess, oh, let's see. I don't know if I've got a pointer. Oh, there we go. So there's the conus. There's L1, L2, and that's the, how it's approached. Are you seeing my arrow? Yeah, that's how it's approached. Look where we're uh, having to go through to get to that disc, that conus. So dural puncture headache. In another case, 48-year-old um, tall, slender woman with possible Ehlers-Danlos syndrome complained for several months of frequent headaches, generally worse with standing and relieved by laying down flat or at an angle. Brain MRI was remarkable for 7 millimeter cerebellar tonsil descent and diffuse pachymeningeal enhancement. Spinal MRI revealed these diverticuli on multiple levels, but no clear evidence of a leak. Um, multiple um, blood patches were not useful. Um, is, this, uh, is this a case of a leak that was missed? Is it uh, just a second spacing, a third spacing? It's hard to know. But here's an article I, I turned up just um, to irritate. Um, I, I hope it irritates some of you. One of my old teachers said, uh, um, you can't learn without um, being very irritated. So I, I believe that. As all of my, I, I was a neurology residency program director for many years, and I'd say the majority of my residents would agree with um, that. At least that I did, that I used that method. So here by Kranz et al. Um, analysis of prevalence uh, 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 of myelographic appearance. So despite the well-established association between spinal meningeal diverticula and SIH, we found no difference in the prevalence or myelographic appearance of diverticula in patients with SIH. So we'll, see, we'll hear more about that. I'm sh I'm certain. Um, all right. What about the other? side of the coin. Patients who um, do not have intracranial hypotension, do not have intracranial hypovolemia, um, are there, uh, is there a significant number of uh, uh, people who have postural headaches who don't have intracranial hypotension? What do you all think? Do you think that's a possibility? Yes. Big number? I think so. I think so. It's like my uh, fundoscopic exam that I'm getting, I'm seeing more and more drusen. It really, it's very similar. I think we're, I'm seeing more and more postural headaches that are not due to intracranial hypotension, which is a very confounding issue. And here are, I made a list. I don't think it's a complete list. I'd love to expand it. I'm open to suggestion. Migraine, benign exertional headache, sinusitis-induced headache, meningitis, uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia, uh, venous thrombosis, cerebral venous thrombosis, subdurals, subarachnoids, tumors, and not just huge tumors, that's the problem. And, and uh, vascular disease of different types. So let me show you a couple of these. Um, so this is the International Classification of Headache Disorders for Migraine Without Aura. We don't have to go through all the details, but let me just show you one part of it, one important part. Increased by physical activity. Well, if you sit and talk to patients with migraine, there, are, there is a small, not large, but small subset who say, when I get a migraine, I cannot be upright. When I get my head, I cannot be upright. I have to lay down. What they usually mean is, not only do they have to lay down, they have to find a dark place, a very quiet place, go lay down and, and take care of themselves. But they will say, I can't stand up. And when you further question them, it's really true. They, they don't want to stand up. Why is that? I don't know. Could it be that there are intracranial mechanics that actually contribute to a postural headache? I don't know. But there is a subset of patients who, who um, give that history pretty clearly. 
We've all had these patients who um, love to exercise. They live for uh, weightlifting, for example. Um, this, like this guy. This is just a picture from the internet, but he looks exactly, almost exactly like my patient, who is addicted to weightlifting. He loves weightlifting. And um, when he does his thing, he gets terrible headaches. Well, he at first talked about um, headaches that only came about when he bent over to pick up this barbell and stood up. You know, interesting history. I don't know quite what to make of it. Sinusitis. If you talk to headache specialists around the world, they will, um, you can pretty easily get them to rant about how there's no such thing as sinus headache and it's been overdiagnosed. And it's true. It's true. The, the, it's, um, sinus headache as an entity is greatly overdiagnosed. However, people can get head pain from sinus inflammation, whether it's acute, even chronic. Um, I think a certain number of things have to be in place for that to happen. Um, but it can happen. And sinuses are, uh, again, very well endowed with nociceptors. And when position changes causes traction, um, headache can happen. It is not just limited to the sinus region. It can, because of what I said earlier, be localized to someplace else in the head. I think particularly if sphenoid sinus is involved. What are the features? Diffuse pain, uh, particularly anteriorly, but not always. Worsen with valsalva, worsen with bending forward. You know, it's, it's easy to diagnose when everything is uh, correct, like green discharge coming from the nose and a fever. Okay, that's easy, but sometimes there are um, confounding factors and fewer symptoms. Hearing changes, including tinnitus, can occur um, because of the connection between the ear and sinuses. Nausea and vertigo can occur, reminiscent of some of the other things you'll hear about today. What about tumors? So I've seen over my career, I've been um, um, doing headache medicine for 30 plus years, and I've seen a, a lot of tumors, obviously. Not uh, the majority of which were causing headaches, but some seem to. And um, I've been really surprised by some of the patients with meningioma I've seen who have positional headaches. And I, I guess in my simple-minded way, I'm thinking, okay, if this is adherent to the dura, dura is very richly endowed, as I keep saying, and position causes some shifting due to that adherence, um, why not? And um, of course, intracranial masses are worsened by Valsalva, so are cases of um, intracranial hypotension and hypertension. I remember in, when I was in med school, I found this fascinating. The, uh, um, uh, third ventricular colloid cysts. I've never seen one. Has anyone seen one? That's my paper. Yes, it is. Why do you think I, why do you think I brought this today? <laughs> Steve Silberstein and, and his colleague, um, Bill Young, reported this, and it's, it turns out not to be that rare. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say, I mean, it's, if you look, um, there will be the occasional patient with these things, and what happens is it's a, it's a valve that gets cut off. It's by this ball valve phenomenon. And hydrocephalus can uh, occur pretty quickly. So um, changing in, uh, position can induce these things. They can be thunderclap, I think, right? Thunderclap headaches. Um, You're and walking down the hall on, a, on the way out of the office, it collapsed. That was the story. I had the bad headache. Found it. And some of the cases are very bland, very benign, just headaches when they stand up. Colloid cyst. Another New Yorker cartoon. Well, as we thought, it's something gross. I usually use that cartoon for uh, cystosarcosis, one of my favorite entities. I'm not sure why. But colloid cyst, fairly gross. What about hematomas, hematomata? Um, obviously, subdurals um, tend to present with headache, um, maybe some focal findings. And we're talking about chronic subdurals, of course. Acute, different story, but chronic subdurals. Headache, um, changes in mental status, um, uh, some focal deficits sometimes, but usually they're pretty bland in presentation. But in my experience, they can present with orthostatic headaches. For the radiologists in the audience, is this a, is this a um, would you call it a, a big subdural? I'm going to have to differ with you. I love that. This, uh, again, to be irritating. I would say this is a big subdural, and the reason I say that is look at the sh look at the amount of uh, ventricular compromise and sulcal effacement. So, you know that's that's a lot of my residents uh, will see that on, they'll you know they'll take it kind of lightly. But this is a big subdural when you think about uh, the blood. But I'm happy to argue later. 
All right. 21 year old college student presented with severe headache for a day and mild nausea. Seen in the ER crying due to pain, unable to sit or stand due to pain intensification. Um, she couldn't answer questions. She couldn't, she really couldn't interact at all. She just kept, um, kept saying, make it stop, make it stop. Terrible headaches. Um, and she couldn't sit or stand up. I'm not sure why, when the answer was revealed. Um, CT was normal, LP uh, revealed uh, meningitis, viral meningitis. These people, I've, I'm sure you've seen them, these people are in incredible pain. It's unbelievable. And this one, as have been some other patients of mine, uh, uh, were very um, forthcoming about not being able to stand up. 34-year-old woman transferred from another hospital due to screaming headaches. This is a patient that I'll never forget because it was, they, they wanted to transfer it to, where, when I was at Dartmouth, they wanted to transfer it to the Dartmouth Neuroservice. And it was being transferred by a former resident of mine. And I said, oh, come on, take care of her headaches. I trained you, you know how to do it. And he said, no, no, I can't, she's screaming. And I said, oh yeah, right. She comes to the hospital and she was screaming with pain. She resisted any movement. She just remained in the fetal position. She couldn't move. She couldn't do anything. And none of us knew what to do. Um, CT scan was normal. Uh, LP was normal. Um, no recent trauma. No headaches in the past. She had started birth control pills a few weeks ago. That was it. Um, because I had seen a case of cerebral venous thrombosis, I decided to get a, a venogram. Here's her CT scan, by the way. It looked fine. Um, MRI showed this blush, this subcortical blush that we can see sometimes in CVT, and the venogram showed a complete cutoff of the superior sagittal sinus. She had big time CVT, a lot of clot. And I don't know if you know this, but CVT, we're not talking about a little clot like in a stroke. This is a massive clot in, in, within the venous system. Interestingly, this is, this is for the radiologists in the audience too, we should have looked better at this CAT scan. Does anybody see it? I didn't, these are not the delta. empty delta sign. Very good. I knew you'd, I knew you'd get that. So right there, with, after contrast, there was a filling defect there. So we should have seen that there was thrombosis, but we didn't. Cerebral venous thrombosis. Very positional. Here are the features that you all know of intracranial hypotension. Postural headaches, worsened by activity, Valsalva. Um, pain is usually bad, not invariably. Pain character can be a lot of different things, but they uh, describe dull, uh, throbbing, variable locations. History of a procedure, I think very important detail, but pain may start after a lag time. Valsalva may worsen the pain, or none of the above. Some more. Vertigo, tinnitus, decreased hearing due to changes in perilymph. Cranial nerve palsies, um, supposedly due to traction of cranial nerves due to uh, crowding of the brainstem. Um, nausea, photophobia, phonophobia. Uh, headache may abate. I love this with pressure on the abdomen. Does this ever work? I think so too. I think so too. I, I haven't been doing it for a long time, but just for about the last year, it sometimes works. It's a kind of a neat little bedside um, diagnostic tool. Um, when patients put in Trendelenburg, Trendelenburg, now I've never seen that to work. I wish I, I did. Have you? I, I just I haven't seen that to work. So a lot of a lot of clues, or none of the above, or none of the above. Um, I just thought I'd throw this in as a as a, another maybe irritant, I guess. Um, when you see these patients, it's it's great obviously to fit them into a category. But what if they just won't fit? What if they don't present? much in the way of, uh, of uh, symptoms and signs. Does that mean they don't have intracranial hypotension? No. And so I just made a list here, you don't, I'm not going to go through it, of just chronic daily headaches, very frequent headaches, some of which might represent intracranial hypotension, sadly. Some more secondary headaches, lots and lots. I just thought I'd spend half a minute on radiological features that lead you down the path of intracranial hypotension, but may not, um, you may not need to go there. For example, brain sag, also seen in other conditions. Pachymeningeal enhancement, also seen, of course, in meningitis, meningeal carcinomatosis, post-LP, maybe they've had an LP recently, um, and, and venous sinus thrombosis. 
What about subdurals? What about these subdural collections? Are they a, a good clue? Well, what if it's just subdural collections due to trauma? And the enlarged pituitary, don't get me started, right? <laughs> we see it so much we don't know quite what to do with it. But I'm sure you'll hear more about that today. So let me opine in my last few seconds what we actually mean by a differential diagnosis. Here's what I think we mean, and I've, I will entertain happily um, uh, discussion later. Could this patient have intracranial hypotension? Number two, maybe more importantly, could this patient with the diagnosis of intracranial hypotension have something else? And, um, you know, we, when we answer these questions, we all have a lot of biases based on the latest case we saw, uh, based on how we think about illness, you know, whether we're risk takers or not risk takers, whether we believe in do no harm to the exclusion of all else or not. Um, one of the biases that I think is kind of fascinating is the fact that patients want us to have a diagnosis. Patient real, patients really want us to have a diagnosis. She says, I hope you're not going to be like the 20 incompetent doctors who couldn't find anything wrong with me. So, and finally, I wanted to just explore one quick little thing. At uh, UCSF, a lot of us in the headache center decided, and, well, I decided, um, but I made everybody think about what our heuristic should be. Now, you know where I'm going with this, how impossible it is to make a heuristic to diagnose intracranial hypotension. It's really hard. And I finally realized, actually, just a couple of days ago, the reason it's hard is because this is a myth. Flow chart diagnostic thinking is a myth. We don't really do it that way. What we really do, here's a heuristic. I think this is about figuring out if your brakes are good on the car, but anyway, don't read it. But we have these heuristics in medicine. What I think we really do is we have this um, more iterative approach, which I couldn't find a better picture than this. In other words, we go down a path and we hit a wall and we realize we've been down the wrong path. We have to retread into another path. And the same thing happens over and over. And if we do it right, it's to the betterment of our patients, of course. But it's really different than the heuristic. Anyway, I thought I'd share that. So thanks for listening. I have a few conclusions that I thought I'd share with you. Um, basically, just what I think key clues are, um, which are orthostatic headache, of course, um, these accompanying symptoms of hearing change in vertigo, uh, possibly cranial nerve palsies, um, no signs of serious systemic illness, um, a paucity of, oops, paucity of neuro deficits, no meningismus, response to EBPs, um, typical brain MRI features, which you'll be hearing a lot about today, otherwise normal uh, imaging, and uh, very useful precipitating um, event like surgery. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for listening.